Lawyers can be positive too. This is not all about negative, scare stories. We're trying to help you uh, develop the industry, develop VR. Um, I've been a passionate fan of VR since the mid-1990s when I first saw that awful film, The Lawnmower Man. Anybody reckon, anyone seen The Lawnmower Man? It was a ridiculously awful film. Um, but it was all about VR, and I was smitten by it. I thought, this is the future. I have to work in VR. And then I became a lawyer. Um, and I waited until the technology caught up. So I now lead the technology practice at Harbottle & Lewis. We're a UK law firm. We're one of the, the premier law firms for the gaming industry. And we're probably the, the, the premier law firm in relation to VR, because we're all about media and technology. So um, I've only got 25 minutes. That's not long enough to go through all of the legal issues around VR. So I'm going to hit some highlights and look at legal issues that are particularly relevant to VR as opposed to other games. OK. Uh, let's start with an obvious one. Let's start with uh, personal injury. This is now Ronnie O'Sullivan. Oh, wow. What are you going for, the six? Oh, oh wrong. Jesus f***ing hell. That is Did you try and lean on a table? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's scary. So I love that video. So that, that guy, for those who don't recognize him, is Ronnie O'Sullivan. He is probably the best snooker player there's ever been. Um, that was his first experience of VR. So he was playing pool. Um, and he was so convinced by it, he actually thought he was in the game. So when the shot was there, he just leant over and tried to lean on a table that just wasn't there. So, you know, Ronnie got hurt. So, you know, an obvious thing we need to think about are personal injury type issues. Now, everyone will be familiar with the Nintendo Wii platform, I'm sure. This is the audience to say yes to that. Um, so you'll be familiar probably with these two things on the Wii. So the reason I mention those is because personal, personal injury, liability is nothing new. It changes per platform. Now, I wasn't advising Nintendo when they developed the Wii. I don't know this for certain, but I'd be willing to lay quite a lot of money that that little wrist strap on the handset was not there on the initial versions of the game internally. They only added that after some product testing. Why did they add that? Because they realized that when people were playing tennis or running around with sweaty hands, that the, the handset can just fly across the room, smash into a window, or an adult or a child, um, and they were worried about the potential liability for injury caused by their device. Equally, the, uh, the little pause screen that comes up every mm, 10, 15, 20 minutes or so, you know, showing a nice open window with blowing curtains and a blue sky, saying, oh, please, you know, consider not doing what you've paid to do. Go and do something else outside. So, you know, why do they include that screen? It's not to stop you being engaged with the game. It's because they're worried that you might get so engaged with the game that you'll get tired, obsessed, you'll stop doing other stuff, and they might face some kind of liability for that. So it's worth thinking about how Nintendo learnt to do those things, those safety precautions, when you're thinking about how to develop your game. So as a, as a lawyer in most legal systems, you'll look at if somebody suffers injury, I, I, either a physical injury, they fall over, they bump their head on something, or maybe they feel unwell. We've heard about nausea, maybe eye defects, you know, some kind of eye injury as well. We'll think about what caused the injury. Is it the actual hardware, in which case the hardware manufacturer needs to think about any kind of safety precautions like Nintendo did? Or is it the, uh, the, the, the content? Is it the actual program? Is it the game that's not designed in the right way, that's causing the injury? So have a think about how, the, how that works. I mean, other things to think about in terms of um, personal injury, I mean, think about Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go, massive success. My kids love Pokemon Go. Um, yeah, and certainly in the early days, we've, we've heard a number of lawsuits, particularly in the US, brought by landowners where Pokestops have been put or where particularly rare Pokemon can be found. They don't want people trampling all over their, all over their land. So how, do, how does Pokemon make sure that it's not responsible for that kind of thing? So health and safety, personal injury, obviously very important to think about, but not the only issue. Second issue, virtual assault, okay? Virtual assault. So the first one is real-world physical injury. This is virtual assault. You're in 
a virtual reality experience, particularly imagine a multiplayer virtual reality experience, and another user punches you. Now, at the moment, you're not actually going to feel any physical pain. But you know, there are haptic devices around, such as a haptic glove, which will allow you to feel temperature, perhaps pressure. Um, so it won't be very long before we can feel a realistic handshake from something like that. If you can feel a realistic handshake, could you feel a, a slap or a punch? If you're wearing a haptic bodysuit, eventually, could you feel a punch? Now, it might be that that's not a problem. It might be that actually that's the whole point of the experience. Your users want to go into a virtual boxing match and punch and hit each other. Maybe in due course we'll see a world heavyweight title fight fought between two players on completely different continents using virtual reality and a full haptic suit. But what if it's not? And I know that the haptic technology at the moment probably doesn't allow you to get actually hurt, but certainly under UK law, you can be guilty of assault if you just make someone feel that they're about to get hurt. Okay? If, they, if they really feel an, a pressing requirement, they're, they're about to get thumped by something, that can actually be assault under English law. So the more immersive your VR experience gets, the more believable it is, the more potential for something like this might happen. If you're designing your VR experience, think about the kinds of things you need to tell your users about what might happen to them in the game. If they're in the game involves going into a bar and actually somebody might come up and, th and thump them, Probably a good idea that they know that that might happen before they go in. Probably a good idea you don't let children play that type of game or even go into that type of place. Okay, that's virtual assault. What about cyber security? So, not a new issue, obviously. We're all very aware of how important it is to make sure that your, your systems, your data is secure, um, and that you don't get hacked. But I think it's of particular relevance in virtual reality um, for this reason. That a VR experience, if you're doing your job properly, I, as the user, feel that I'm in that world. I'm interacting with it. I'm looking how it, how it goes. Um, I don't really feel that there's another world out there. That's where I am. If a hacker gets control of that world, they're almost playing God with my reality at that point. I mean, there's, there are some some scary things that, that, that could happen once a hacker gets hold of that, that type of world. So I think proper cybersecurity um, is incredibly important for a VR experience. You know, if you take VR to, to a logical extreme, something like the Matrix, where actually people in the Matrix never even knew there was a real world out there. That, that is all their world. Obviously, we're not there yet, but you, know, you, you can see that, that might, that's where we might get up to. Um, I mean, yes, that raises some of the questions we've already heard about, cybersecurity and that kind of thing. Um, but I think a particular legal question in relation to that kind of environment would be, if I'm in a virtual world, am I behaving in the same way as I would behave in the real world? If I'm consenting to something in a virtual world, is that me consenting? Or is that my virtual persona consenting? If I then step out into the real world, and I, I might say, well, hang on, no, 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 I, was clearly, I clearly didn't agree to that. That's ridiculous that I you know, agree to that. That's not me. So, the more, again, the more immersive you make your, your experience, which is brilliant, we all want them to be really immersive, um, just keep in mind that that does create more difficulties for gathering consent, making people aware and informed about what the experience will be like. Ideally, all of that information will be, will be provided up front before they step into the world. And you'll have proof of that too. We've touched on data from a data security perspective, but I think VR has the potential to be the ultimate data gathering platform. I mean, just think about the types of data you can collect about your users in your VR experience. You could collect where they are, how they move, how their head moves, where their eyes are looking. Um, if you're connected to some biometric sensors as well, heart rate, perspiration levels, body temperature, all of that data could be really useful, of course. Um, what else could you create, uh, collect? Uh, how fast the user is moving around the room. How, who they're interacting with, um, both in terms of items and other things. What type of system they're running, the performance, the latency, all of that kind of stuff. Now, there's some obvious ways in which you might want to use that information. You might want to make your system better. 
work out what people are interacting with and give them more of that kind of stuff, work out what they're not interacting with and take that kind of stuff away. And so to make your system better, you can think that the user's probably going to be okay with that. Um, if you're collecting that data to make sure you're tracking people so that if they get maybe a very high heart rate or become erratic in the game, that maybe you flash up that Nintendo Wii warning screen to say, actually, do you want to take a break for a minute? That might be a good idea as well. But what happens if you want to collect that data so you can market stuff to them? You can say, oh, we can see that actually when you're playing that game, um, you're not as, I know, you're not, not doing it as well as somebody else. Here's some training materials that can help you. Or we might want to sell your data to some drug companies who, who can market to you as well. Um, and then there's all other kind of data you can, you can have as well. So I paid you the Ronnie O'Sullivan video at the start, and there's a bunch of other videos like that, of course. And actually, one of the funniest things about VR is watching other people have VR experiences. They're hilarious, watching somebody play VR, particularly for the first time. Um, it's a bit voyeuristic, though. So, you know, what are you doing with that kind of imagery? How are you collecting those, those images? Who are you sharing them with? And then you have the other kind of basic kind of level of personal information you'll be collecting anyway with your games. The name of the user, their email address, uh, the basic kind of registration data. So just generally, brilliant loads of rich data can be collected. You can't just do what you want to do with them. There are laws that apply, data protection and other laws that apply to what you can collect and how you can use it, and you can, who you can give it to. So just have a little think about how you structure those. Getting it wrong can be very painful. A number of you may, may be aware that the rules in Europe will be changing significantly next May, uh, with the greatest fines now being up to 20 million euros, or 4% of your worldwide turnover, which is a big number for anybody. So just be careful about what data you collect and how you want to use it. Um, if you have a great idea about collecting data and using it, then think about the extent to which you should be telling users and making sure the users can tell you that that's okay. You can get their consent. But how do you get consent to a VR experience? Now, is it good enough now just to have a privacy policy accessible when they log in? So, yeah, I've downloaded the game. Yeah, I want to play. Oh, T's and C's. No one ever bothered reads, reads those, right? Scroll to the bottom, click accept. Privacy policy. I'm not going to read something else as well. I'm just going to click, click to accept that. Because of the level of data that a VR experience can collect and the richness of it, the sensitiveness of it, um, I think it requires a new approach to privacy. Not just VR, actually, lots of other technologies. And we're seeing a, a step change away from lengthy tech, lengthy policies, towards dashboards, privacy dashboards. So think about how you collect that kind of consent. Don't just bury it in your T's and C's. That will not work anymore. You have to be able to show that your users understood what you're doing and told you that that's fine. Two particular issues on privacy before I move on. One, children, obviously very relevant to the mobile gaming space. If you are, have users between the ages of 14 and 18, are they children? Can you rely on their consent? Hands up if you think you can rely on the consent of a, let's say, 15-year-old to, to use their data. Anybody? In the UK, the answer is probably yes. In France, no. Um, the basic rules are, between 14 and 18, each country, under the new rules next year, will get to set their level of what they consider to be a child from a data perspective. We're expecting countries like the UK and Ireland to say 14 is fine, unless there are obviously other circumstances applying. But pretty much every other country will say, you've got to be 18. And if you're not... And if you are classified as a child, you'll need parental consent too. You have to think about how to build that in. One other point before I forget on, on privacy. Um, one of the key issues in the relation to the changes next year is also about the responsibility you will have as running the service for making sure that all of your contractors, your processors, your hosting provider, they're doing this, the things that they should be doing. Have proper contracts in place with them, with proper clauses. If you don't, you face the liability. Okay, so a new approach to privacy. Um, I think a new approach to ratings as well is on its way. We'll be familiar with these kind of ratings. Um, so age brackets and then little warnings of uh, whether something has bad language in it or drugs or fear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, these ratings have been appropriate for games up to this point, but I think VR is different purely because of the immersiveness of it. 
So you might have had a game that might have rated, say, 12 under these ratings. Perhaps it should be 16 in VR because it's more immersive. It's more scary. There's something behind you that really is right behind you. So don't be surprised to see a different approach being taken on ratings and perhaps um, a new set of ratings being developed just for VR experiences. One other thought, talent agreements. So here's Brad Pitt um, advertising some, uh, some lovely perfume. So is Brad Pitt doing that because he really likes the perfume? Of course he's not, he's being paid a lot of money to do that. Um, he's being paid a lot of money and he's under a contract to do that. He'll have signed a contract with Chanel giving them the rights to feature him's image in certain adverts. That contract will say uh, which photos can be used. He'll probably have the right to approve which photos. It'll say uh, where the adverts can be shown, so which media and in which territories and for how long, and it might have a bunch of other conditions. But it's a static image, right? As long as they don't deface it in some way, put some goggles on it or a big spot or something. You know, he said, like, you can use that image, off you go and do it. VR is different. So I was advising a, um, a model in, in the UK who was appearing, who was a, a supermodel, appearing in a VR experience. And that VR experience was, wasn't just a 360 video, it was interactive, so the user could actually interact with the model. Now you can imagine the kind of things that the model would be worried about. Hang on, how, well, how can this person interact with me? Um, I want to make sure that nothing inappropriate is happening. So that talent agreement took a lot longer to negotiate because of the ways in which the model could be used in a VR experience. If you're using talent, it doesn't have to be a supermodel, it could be anybody, um, featuring in your VR experience, just expect these things to take a bit more time. We've had to rattle through some of the highlight legal issues, again, the ones that specifically relate to VR rather than general gaming. I mean, yet yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff we could talk about. We could talk about intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyright. We could talk about jurisdiction. Um, we talk about you know, a, a number of different other areas. I guess the key point is that VR is brilliant. I mean, we all want VR to succeed, and I think it really will. Um, but real-world law applies in the virtual world. I mean, Facebook found that out last week when it lost a half a billion dollar claim against um, ZeniMax in relation to the Oculus Rift um, issue. So please don't forget that. Um, here's Alice, about to head down her rabbit hole. Um, Please don't fall down the legal rabbit hole. Get some good advice before you do that. Thank you. When do you think uh, actual countries will be drawn upon to put in legislation into, into creating um, enforced regulation that developers will have to start heeding? Um, well, specifically to VR? Specifically to VR and even, even uh, its sibling AR. I, I don't think there are any plans at the moment for specific VR or AR regulation. The existing laws already provide the, the basic principles. So, I mean, for example, in relation to product safety, you know, the obligation is of anybody providing a product or service to the public to make sure that they're taking reasonable steps to make sure it's safe. So, for example, you know, a knife manufacturer, I hear this all the time, but all oh, knife manufacturers, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not banned. Um, no, they're not. But um, knife manufacturers, when they sell their knives, I mean, yes, you could use it to chop food, or could you, you could use it to stab somebody, but the knife manufacturer can't control what you do with it after it's sold it to you. Um, for a VR platform, for a VR experience, if you're the one providing the experience, you control everything that happens in that experience. So the, so the, the laws will, will assume that the, the provider of that experience effectively controls that. So if something happens in that experience that creates a danger to somebody, you need to be thinking about whether you should be preventing that or warning them in advance. Right, because earlier this year we had um, we had basically a report of sexual harassment, and I think it was Altspace. Uh, then we mm. also have uh, the the gentleman at uh, Ubisoft earlier today talking about a person who's connected to a social VR experience. I believe it was the werewolf one. Um, can actually feel antagonized. Yeah. Um, do they have rights? Can that just be in the privacy policy that you weren't aware of, but it was something along the way? Well, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's why I think just burying this kind of stuff in T's and C's when the privacy policy just, just won't wash anymore. Um, I mean, you know, even kind of non so traditional games, they can antagonize people. Right. I mean, you know, we, we've, there, there have been cases of you know, people fighting over World, World of Warcraft battles or stealing virtual things from each other. Yeah. We've had lots of court cool cases about that kind of stuff. I think the thing about VR is because it's particularly immersive, it just feels much more personal to you. It's happening to you, not to your avatar. 
And that, that's where the issue comes. Right. Hi, my name is Luis from Portugal. Hello, Luis. I have the obvious question about data, data privacy. What about Brexit? <laughs> What's going to happen with the information from the UK? Yeah, so, I mean, we know what Brexit means. According to our Prime Minister, Brexit means Brexit, right? Brilliant. She, sh she should write a dictionary, shouldn't she? Um, so, from a, from a UK perspective, uh, the current assumed wisdom, and I think this is correct, is that post-Brexit, the same rules will carry on applying in the UK. I think that's going to happen for one of two reasons. One, the UK has been one of the lead negotiating entities in the new data protection laws coming through next year. So we've done all the work anyway. We've already agreed them. Why won't we just carry on with them? Second, yeah, there are very few UK companies that don't also operate in Europe. So if they're going to have to comply with those rules, they might as well comply with the rules in the UK. And if we have very different rules in the UK from Europe, then there's a risk that the European Commission would, would deem us not to be an adequate territory. Pretty high risk, I would have thought. Um, and therefore, yeah, we, basically, we'd be in the same position as the US now and have to go through a bunch of negotiations about having some kind of privacy arrangements. So nobody can be sure about this kind of stuff, but I think the reality is um, the rules will almost certainly carry on applying in the way they are now for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Daniel, for your time. Okay. A little applause. Thank you.